Well, good morning. morning. We're going to continue our journey uh, with Moses today. As we we left off yesterday, we we saw that God had had put a call on Moses' life. And as we've noticed in this story, it was a call that, that Moses had years ago hoped and dreamed and believed that God was going to put on his life a call to deliver and rescue his people. But if you remember from yesterday, Moses, Moses is going to have some great doubts about this call. It's been 40 years. A lot's happened. And Moses is going to really come to a place where he believes that God should indeed deliver his people. And he's excited about that, but he doesn't want to do it. And I think it's not because... It's not because he wanted to be disobedient to God. It's not because he he didn't want to see his people set free. But he didn't believe that he could do it. And and we talked yesterday about some of the things that might have been going on in his mind and in his heart. And a little bit of why. And today we're going to dive a little further into that. And as I hinted at yesterday, we're going to talk about insecurities. Right Now I know none of you have ever felt insecure right? But other people have, right? Other people in this room have, right? I have. Everyone has. And we're going to see Moses deal with that. But yesterday we talked about how he was wrestling with that who am I question, right? Like, who am I to do this? I I messed up. I murdered an Egyptian. I'm I'm a shepherd now. I don't even own these sheep. They're my my father-in-law's sheep. And it's been 40 years. I can't do this. I'm not worthy. I'm not qualified. I'm not able. Moses was intimidated and insecure. Intimidated and insecure. Now, God had told Moses what? I'm going to be what? What did he tell him? I'll be what? With you. I'm going to be with you. Now, we would all agree that that should have been what? Enough. Right? If God says, I'm going to be with you, then we should feel what? Confident? Right? If, have you ever been in a situation where, because of who you were with, you felt more confident than you would have felt by yourself? Have you ever done something that you wouldn't have done if you were by yourself? Right? Good or bad, right? There, there's a confidence that can come when we're with someone. And, and so God says He's going to be with Him. God's promised to be with us. But sometimes, even though we know that, and even though we believe that, it's, it's not enough, is it? We, 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 we know it. But we still feel intimidated. We still feel insecure. I've talked about the fact that I believe God has a call on each of your lives. And there's going to be times where that call causes you to feel intimidated and insecure. That God's going to call you to be in places and to do things. He already is and He will. Where you're going to feel like, I can't do this. This is, I can't. I can't not do this. And I wrestled with that. When I felt God calling me to ministry, I thought, there's no way. Right? There is no way that I can do I don't have the abilities. I'm not a good speaker. Moses is going to have the same, same questions. But we're going to see today that God is able to work even in our insecurities. And here's what I, the thought I want you to have in your mind. Your insecurities are not a problem. They're not the problem that you think. In fact, we're going to see that they are the perfect place for God to work powerfully in our lives. And God's not so much interested in taking them away as He is at showing us Himself and His power in those places and showing us that it's He that does it and not us. So if you have your Bible, which I hope you do, Exodus chapter 13, or Exodus chapter 3, all right, coffee hasn't quite got to the brain yet. Exodus chapter 3, verse 13 is where we're going to begin. Then Moses asked God, if, if, notice, notice what he says, if I go to the Israelites, I'm not saying I'm, he's like, God, hear me out. I'm not saying that I'm going, right? Have you ever had a moment like this? But suppose, suppose I actually did go, God. Not, now, God, don't get any ideas. This is not my Yes. If I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? 
What should I tell them? So he asked God a question. Verse 14, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. The name that God chooses for himself. Right? There's many names for God throughout the Bible, throughout the Old Testament, but this name is his covenant name. It, it is the name that, that came to be known in Hebrew as Yahweh. Right? And Yahweh is probably a shortened form of this phrase, I am who I am. There is no equal, there is no comparison, there is no one on the other side of the equation, I am who I am. You are to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. They would have known and heard the covenant name of God. Verse 15, God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is how I am to be remembered in every generation. Go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, has appeared to me and said, I have paid close attention to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. And here's just yet another reminder that God had not forgotten his people. He was not unaware of their suffering. He was not unaware of their affliction and their slavery. But God had a purpose for it. And now his purpose was to deliver them. And he says, I've paid attention. I've seen, verse 17 says, And I have promised you, Moses, I've promised that I, not you, I will bring you up from the misery of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites and all the other peoples that were there. Verse 18, they will listen to what you say. They will listen. He says, Moses, I know you're intimidated. Right? I know, I know you've been playing in your mind all those memories for 40 years of what if and if only and I'm not worthy and all those things and you talk to sheep all day. I get that. But here's the thing. I'm choosing you. I'm doing it. And they will listen to you. Don't be afraid. Then you, along with the elders of Israel, must go to the king of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now please let us go on a three-day trip into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. However, I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go unless he is forced by a strong hand. I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles that I will perform in it. And after that, he will let you go. I will give this people such favor in the sight of the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty handed. Verse 22, for each woman will ask her neighbor and any woman staying in her house for the silver and the gold jewelry and the clothing, and you will put them on your sons and your daughters, and so you will plunder the Egyptians. Right, so God gives him some incredible promises. He says, Moses, Right? I, I know you're intimidated. I know you're insecure. I know you don't feel able. But he doesn't, he doesn't try to pump him up, like we talked about yesterday. He, he doesn't tell him, he doesn't remind him of all his strengths and abilities. He just says, I'm going to be with you. Right? My hand will be, they will listen. Right? Here's my promises. I'm going to deliver my people. You can trust me. And we would think, we might hope, we might expect that Moses should be what now? What should Moses be now? Anybody? So I heard something. Confident. confident. Yeah, Moses should be confident. Moses ought to be good to go, right? Like, oh yeah, I, I was a little intimidated. I, I was kind of insecure, but yeah, God's promised me this. But notice, notice chapter 4. He is still mired in intimidation and insecurity. Then Moses answered, he says, what if? What if they don't, won't believe me? And will not obey me, but say the Lord didn't appear to you. What if? Has your mind ever got stuck on the what ifs, right? What if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if this? And so many times the what if things that we worry about don't ever happen anyway. Did you notice that? But here's the thing. It, it's, it's, it's really not a great question because what if they didn't listen? Right? What has he got to lose? Right? God's called them. It's not even his idea or his mission. What if? He says, what if they, they won't believe you? God's promised them. He says, what if? Sometimes our minds just run wild with what ifs. And if that's you, you can know you're not alone. 
And even Moses struggled with the what ifs. But notice God's patience and grace. Now, how many of you might think if you were God, right? Which I know is a little bit of a crazy thought. You're not and never will be. But if you were, how many of you might say at this point, how patient would you be with Moses? Not very. You'd be like, come on, Moses. What else do I have to say? Right? I'm with you. Right? There's a bush on fire that's speaking to you. Come on, Moses. Right? I've made these promises. You always wanted to do this. You believed you were born for this. And now I'm giving you the opportunity to do this, and you're what ifing me? But notice God's patience. The Lord asked him, He said, What's in your hand? A staff, he replied. Then he said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground, verse 3, and it became a snake. And Moses ran from it, right? So any, anyone scared of snakes? All right, several of you. Uh, one of our three directors I know for certain is quite terrified of snakes. I will not tell you which one. But Moses was scared of snakes, all right? And so he throws down his staff, and all of a sudden it's a snake, and Moses said, yeah, right? And he ran away. But the Lord said to him, stretch out your hand and grab it by the tail. Right now, here's Moses. He's already intimidated. He's already insecure. And God's like, I, I want you to pick up that snake. Moses is like, this isn't happening, right? You ever had those moments? Where like, this, uh, why did I ever come over and look at this bush? But Moses does what God asks him. So he, he grabs the, the snake by the tail, and it becomes a staff in his hand. Now that's a powerful moment, isn't it? Right? God's showing him his power. Right? His power. And you know, obviously there's allusions with the snake and the serpent and Satan and evil. Right? God's showing his power over evil. And then, verse 5. This will take place, he continued. He says, this will happen again, this sign that I just showed you, so that they will believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. In addition, the Lord said, Lord said to him, put your hand inside your cloak. So he put his hand inside his cloak. Then he said, pull your hand outside of your cloak. And it was diseased. It had leprosy. His hand all of a sudden was all gross and nasty with, with, a, with leprosy, which is an awful skin disease. Moses is like, I don't think I should have done that, right? And then he says, put your hand back in your cloak. And when he took it out, it was completely healed. And God showed his power, right? He showed a sign. He showed his power. He says, if they will not believe you, verse 8, and will not respond to the evidence of the first sign, they may believe the evidence of the second sign. And then God goes even further. Verse 9, and if they don't believe even these two signs or listen to what you say, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. So now God has graciously given him three miraculous signs to go along with the burning bush, which was its own miraculous sign, to go along with his promises and his call, right, that he's going to be with him, that he's going to do it, right, and God's been patient and gracious, in all of this. So now, certainly, Moses is going to move on from his what-if arguments and say yes to God, right? No, not exactly. Look at verse 10. Moses is going to move from a what-if argument to a but argument. Are you right? Are you with me? He says, but, right? But Moses replied to the Lord, please, Lord, I have never been an eloquent, I've never been eloquent, either in the past, which may have been really a distortion of the truth because in Acts chapter 7 we're told that Moses was trained in language and in speech, but it's been a long time. He says either in the past he was looking down on himself or recently or since you've been speaking to me. He says, you notice even in our conversation I've kind of stuttered while I'm talking to you. He says, I am slow and hesitant in speech. So he went from his, he said, the what if argument didn't work with God. So now I'm going to do a but, but, but God, I'm not good enough. God, you want me to be this speaker? You want me to speak to all the people of, of, of the Israelites, the Hebrew people? You want me to go to Pharaoh and speak? God, God, you're crazy. I'm not good enough to do that. I'm not a good speaker. I stutter. I get my words tied. I, I, I mean, I, I haven't spoken Egyptian in so long. I, ah, this is not a good idea. I can't because... 
Right? There's going to be those times in life where you're going, to, you're going to be in a situation where God's calling you to do something and you're going to say, I can't. I can't because. And the reason is all going to be centered around something about you. Your limitations, your insecurities, your inabilities. And I think for Moses, he was like, God, this is awesome. And the snake thing, that was really cool. The leprosy thing, amazing. And I'm sure the, the pouring the water and turning into blood would be awesome. But I'm not a good speaker. Notice God's response, verse 11. The Lord said to him, who made the human mouth? He's like, come on, Moses. Who made your mouth? Who makes man mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. Go, Moses. I will help you speak. I will teach you what to say. Right? Isn't it amazing how God is so gracious? Right? That, that when we have all of our, our, our pushback against him, and whether that's coming out of defiance or if it's just coming out of fear or insecurities, as I think it was with Moses, that God is patient and he's gracious. But you know, we get so focused sometimes on ourselves, don't we? So focused on ourselves. And when you get focused on yourself, you're either going to be prone to think too much of yourself, right? I'm so talented, I'm so smart, right? I'm so athletic, I'm gifted, I'm all these things, right? And, and I might have an overinflated view of self. But a lot of times, it's the opposite. When we look at ourselves, right, we see all the problems, all the flaws, all the failures, all our mistakes, our sin, that habit that I'm struggling with, right, the, the weaknesses that I feel, and I feel like everybody can see them and everybody else doesn't have them. You've ever felt like that? We get so focused on our failures, our limitations, our inadequacy, and God says, Moses, you're, you're thinking about it wrong. It's, it's not about, yeah, you, you have a speech problem, but that's not a problem for me. He says, I'm going to help you. I'll be with you. I called you. You can do this. Surely now Moses, Moses will be ready, right? Notice Moses' tactic. Now, he tried what if. Well, first of all, he said, if I go, but I'm really not going to go. And then he's like, well, what if? And then, but... And now verse 13, Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. Moses is like, all right, it's not working, right? I tried the what ifs and I tried the buts. Like, you know, you, know, you ever tried to like drop a hint to someone and they didn't get it? And then you're like, I'm going to have to be a little more direct. <laughs> Moses is like, God, you're not taking the hint. So let me be plain. Send someone else. I'm all for you doing this. I'm excited you're going to do this, but please use someone else. Now, at this point, God's patience does appear to wear a little thin. Notice verse 14. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses. And he said, isn't Aaron the Levite your brother? I know he can speak well. And I, I almost think it was a little bit of a, you know, with Moses. He's like, I, I know your brother can speak well. Also, he's on his way to meet you now. And when he sees you, his heart will rejoice. You will speak with him and tell him what to say. And I will help both you and him. And will teach you both what to do. He will speak to the people for you. And he will be your spokesman. And you will serve as God to him. And take this staff in your hand that you will perform the signs with. Notice God, God, doesn't, God doesn't accept Moses' refusal. He was like, no, your brother, I, I'll allow your brother to go with you and he can even do some of the speaking, but you are going to go. I have called you. I've chosen you. I'm going to use you and you are going to go. Moses is reluctant. He's intimidated and he's insecure. One of the things that I love about God's word is God never glosses over the, the weaknesses the limitations, the failures of his people. And you know, I think for a lot of us, if we grew up in church, if we've grown up around the Bible, we sort of see the Bible characters as superheroes, right? These incredibly perfect, awesome people who did awesome things and got to be, have their stories recorded in the Bible. But they were just ordinary people, ordinary men and women 
who had problems and challenges, who had weaknesses, and as we see with Moses, who had insecurities, who were intimidated and overwhelmed. And the Bible shows us that even the leaders needed rescuing. Right? Even the leaders needed rescuing. We all face things in life that cause us to feel intimidated and insecure. Right? We all do. And if you're going to follow God's call on your life, it's not going to be free from things that intimidate you and cause you to feel insecure. Like, it would be great if God would just zap us, like in a good way. Are you with me? Not like in a bad way. But if he would just zap us, right, and our insecurities would be gone. And, and, and you know, like, hey, God, you've called me, and wow, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm confident in you, and I just, I live that way the rest of my life. I would love, I love that, but that's not how God's chosen to work. And maybe it's because we would be overconfident that we would forget. There's a lot of times that I've prayed for God to help me do something that I felt I could not do, that I was utterly intimidated to do, and then God helped me and I did that, and then I started thinking, I just did that. I'm pretty good. And I'm like, wait a minute, right? I, I was so into, I couldn't do that. God helped me. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. Gave you this verse yesterday. I, I, I want you to, to hang on to this short little verse I believe you're going to need it in the coming days, weeks, months, and years. 1 Thessalonians 5, 24. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Sometimes we're tempted to push back on God's call in our life because of our insecurities. We all have them, and we might overcome some of them, and then find that we have more yet to still overcome. I still have them sometimes. But God is calling you. And I don't want to see you miss out on God's call on your life because you thought, I'm not able, I'm not worthy, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Because that's not true. Right? You are exactly who God saved you and made you to be. He is working in you. He's not finished with you. But He is able to do anything in you and through you that He chooses. Because it's not about you. And it's not about me. It's about Him. And He has made promises to us. And so, I, I want you to, to realize that you're going to have to trust God with those insecurities. And God may not take them away. God may not take those feelings away. But what He will do is show you that your insecurities are not a problem for Him. They're not an obstacle to Him. And it's the very place that His power can work in your life. God's power is most perfectly displayed in our weaknesses. Right? The Apostle Paul, he came to a place where God allowed him to have a weakness, probably physical, but it was a spiritual attack. He called it a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan. He said that was sent to buffet me. And that word literally means to strike with a fist. And Paul said that I begged God to take it away because I hated it. And it was painful. And I knew he could take it away. But instead of taking it away, God said, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul said, I learned to appreciate the weakness. Because then I got to experience his power in my life. God is able to work in those places. And so if you're dealing with and wrestling with insecurities, I want you to know you're not alone. You're not alone. It's normal. It's normal to feel intimidated and overwhelmed. And when you do, know that that is the perfect place for God to work. And so, just a couple questions for you to jot down as you think about what God might be calling you to do. Number one, are you making excuses about why you can't serve God? Why you can't live for Him? Why you can't follow Him? Moses tried to make excuses. Are you wrestling with what ifs? Right? And the ultimate answer to that, I think, is with our what-if questions is this. What we're really saying is, God, what if you fail? Right? Isn't that what we're really saying? God, what if you fail? That was Mo Moses didn't articulate that, but that's really what he was saying. God, what if you fail? You promised this, but what if you don't do it? God is faithful. And we have to bring his promises to those what-if moments. Are you saying, but... God, yes, I know I should deal with this issue. Or I know I should 
take this step. I know you're calling me, but I don't want to. I'm afraid. I'm intimidated. What, what if it costs me this? Or what if I lose this? Or you know, All those things. Wrestle with these questions while you're here. And I ask you to ask God to meet you in those places. Right? And He is able to work in your insecurities. He's able to give you His peace and His presence. And He's able to give you His power to do what He's called you to do. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you for another day that you have blessed us with. And I thank you that we get to spend that day here together at Chehi Summer School of Music. What a blessing it is to be back. It has been so good. And so, Father, I pray that uh, on this day that you've given us, that, that you would help us with our insecurities. Father, there's so many things that, that make us feel intimidated and overwhelmed and give us that I can't feeling. And Moses went through that. But Father, I thank you that you were patient with him and that you were merciful to him. And even when your patience wore thin with him, you were still merciful and gracious and made concessions and showed your, your grace to him. So Father, we know that you will do the same for us, your children. So Father, we ask for your power, which is able to work in our weaknesses, to be made known. And that where we are intimidated and overwhelmed, Father, may we experience your comforting presence. But more than that, may we experience your power and your strength and your presence to realize that those things don't have to hold us back. And that by your grace, we can take steps forward. Father, I ask your blessing over this day. Father, over the work that will go forth today, the practice, the ensembles, the rehearsals, the lessons. Father, I pray your blessing over our times of fellowship and meals and enjoyment. May we encounter you. May we experience you. May you speak to us. And may you be glorified in this day. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.